the soldiers arrived here, <clears throat> um, amongst them was Soldier F. And I'm calling them Soldier F because they were all granted anonymity in 1972. So we have A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on. But be truthful, we know their names. We know who they are. But Soldier F arrived here, looked towards the barricade, which is about 80 to 100 meters just down the street, and he fired a shot into the crowd. There was about 30 or 40 people standing behind the barricade, and Michael was one of them. So Soldier F fired that shot, not caring who it hit. But Michael was the unlucky one, and he was shot in the stomach, and he fell behind the barricade. Now, while that was happening, my mother, she was in that little flat up above, that little apartment. And the reason why she was there is because she followed Michael to keep an eye on him. But she lost track of him. So she went into the little flat to see if she could see him. Whereby she did. And she called to Michael, but Michael didn't hear her. And he ran on towards the barricade. So while she was standing in there looking for her son, Soldier F was murdering him just down the street. And she left that little apartment not knowing that her son had been shot. And I told you earlier on the story, when we arrived back from the hospital, that's when she found out Michael had been shot dead. My name is John Kelly. I am the brother of Michael Kelly, one who was murdered on Bloody Sunday. I, I come from a family, a large family of nine, nine sisters and two brothers. I have lived in Derry all my life and I am employed as the Education and Outreach Officer within the Museum of Free Derry. The museum is to tell the story of the people. This is, um, was set up by an organisation called the Bloody Sunday Trust and they formed in 1997 and they are a human rights group but part of the remit is education. So someone came up with an idea of setting up an archive into the civil rights movement and out of that was born our museum. My job is to help people from all over the world understand the story of the, the conflict here in Derry but my prime uh, job would be to tell the story of Bloody Sunday and that's what I do. So we cover uh, an, er an era between the old history into the recent history and we would cover the likes of the civil rights era, the Battle of the Bogside, Free Derry, Interment, Bloody Sunday and right into Motorman. So that covers that era during that period of time and I am there on a daily basis to actually hopefully educate the people who come into us and to hopefully explain the story of, of the people. So the museum itself is a people's museum. It belongs to the people. It is totally independent. We're not affiliated to any organization whatsoever. So I work for the Bloody Sunday Trust, but I also work for the people. And I am there to speak on behalf of my brother, who was murdered on Bloody Sunday, and all those who died that day as well. So that is my job, and that's what the museum is about. The, the main history of, of the conflict in, in the town happened within the Bogside. You had all the major events. You had the Battle of the Bogside. You had Bloody Sunday. Uh, the on ongoing war that was continuing here. No, uh, Bloody Sunday, uh, I say the Bogside wasn't just the area where it all happened. It happened all over the city and further afield. But Bloody Sunday happened here in the Bogside, out there in Roswell Street. And where, we, where the, the museum is actually situated is in the killing zone of Bloody Sunday. Bloody Sunday happened just directly in, beside the building. And that's the importance of where we are actually situated. We were in two other er uh, places before that, uh, but eventually we got to its home. That's where the home, uh, the, the Museum of Free Derry, that's where the home is. 
That's where Bloody Sunday happened and every other major event as well. So we're in the correct position. For instance, when I turn around and say to people that I am the brother of Michael Kelly, who was murdered on Bloody Sunday, I see some reaction. And that they're actually talking to someone who was there, who was uh, affected by it, and who, is and who is prepared to tell the story. And that itself sells the museum, truthfully. Because a lot of people will come in to us afterwards and say, I was talking to my friend, I was talking to my mother, I was talking to my brother. And they say, go and visit the Museum of Free Dairy and you will probably meet one of the Bloody Sunday relatives. Whilst we were engaged with the, Sab the Bloody Sunday inquiry in the Guildhall, the Bloody Sunday Trust acquired a building in Shippey Street in the middle of the centre of the city. And we occupied that building for seven years. But whilst we were there, it was given to us rent free by a local businessman who owned it. But whilst we were there, we set up a few photographs and a television screen in the corner. And even during that period of time, people visited us to learn what was going on. And I think it was a natural progression into setting up the museum because it moved gradually from A, B, and then eventually C. So, but it was important, and people seen it as being important, so as to tell the story of the people and what happened here. There was no objection from anyone at all when, we set, when, when it was actually set up. Uh, we have never had any interference from any outside sources. We have support from the Derry City Council. They supported us when we set it up. They helped to fund it at the beginning and so on. The Irish government helped to fund it. And many, many people during that period of time donated to the museum. So I think it was a natural progression from the inquiry to what we have now. I was not a, a member of the civil rights movement, but he actually he went out and supported the movement by showing up at the marches and so on. And, but I remember that day, I remember that day well because it was a march that, like all marches, were banned. They were supposedly illegal. And the, the, the march was about internment. It was a protest against internment. And many people at the time were supporting the civil rights movement uh, and, and also supporting the, the people who were in prison. And the march was actually planned a couple of weeks before it, and people looked forward to that day. But I remember talking to Michael just prior to the march, when the people were gathering in the Craigan up in the hill. And I said to him, Michael, just be careful. If anything happens to go home, because Michael was never in the march before. It was his very first march. And the only reason why he went on the march is due to the fact that his friends were going and he wanted to go with them. And there's actually footage of Michael at the start of the march and he was standing right at the very front of the march. And that shows you how na naive he was. But there is footage of him moving out of the march, meeting his friends and going back in again. And that was the last piece of footage we've seen of Michael. So I left him and I, he went with his friends, I went with my friends. And I remember you know, walking along with the march, singing like everyone else and enjoying the crack, as they call here in Ireland, the crack. And people were singing, we should overcome all the civil rights songs. And, uh, and we, we, we had good fun, you know, it was a good day. It was a cold, crisp day, a bit of ice on the ground and so on. But apart from that, it was a nice day. And people were very, very joyful, very happy, singing, walking, enjoying the crack, joking laughing because we didn't expect anything to happen but then as we got closer to William Street which is just at the top of the street there and we passed the St Eugene's Cathedral and the Bishop, Bishop Farn, I remember him standing at the window of the parochial house as we walked past he blessed the march and I found that strange you know I don't think he had any notion of what was going to happen or anything like that but then we went down William Street 
and which is just outside the building just and that was the first time we've seen the soldiers behind their barricades apparently there was about 26 army barricades built around this area to stop the people from coming in stop the people from going out and so on and then as we got on down William Street that was the first time I seen the Paris the paratroopers when you seen the red berries and so on and I can still see them as we walk down on top of the building across the street called the post office but at the same time you know there was nothing there nothing to fear not expecting anything at all the march organizers knew beforehand that the march was going to be stopped at William Street so they organized that the lead vehicle would take the people into Roswell Street so I like hundreds of others followed the vehicle but then I heard a lot of noise at, over on William Street so I went down to William Street and there was a small riot ongoing and small in comparison to what usually happened uh, you know in those days we could have riots that lasted all day like a battle of bogside lasted for three days and two nights a normal riot would last for a few hours some lasted for hours and the only time that they would stop if it rained when people got wet and went home or when people got hungry and went home and so on and we came back again afterwards but it was an on it was an ongoing thing in those days riots every nearly every weekend over there at that corner so i went and watched it for a while and um i got fed up and I decided to come in into the box side and listen to the speeches over free dirty corner i was walking over chamberlain street and i met a guy i knew and he used to take me to to work he drove the car and his name was Barney McGuigan and I spoke to Barney for a couple of minutes along with a couple of friends and left him Barney McGuigan was one of those shot dead on bloody Sunday so I spoke to him a few minutes before he was shot dead so I got into the courtyard of the Roswell Flats which is just behind us and as I did so the, uh, there was a shout that the army had moved into the area it was normal. The army never came into the area into, uh, when, when the riots go on. It never did, but this was different that day. And once that shout went up, we all ran. And the simple reason being was that in those days, well, you took part in a riot, or you were in the periphery of a riot and you were arrested, you went to jail for six months. That was the norm. So we all ran, and I do remember if you can imagine the Roswell Flats like a U-shape, no, two blocks either side, then one at the front, like a shape of a ship of a U. But in between, there was two alleyways where you could exit through either side. So I looked to the right-hand side, and I seen that it was actually jam-packed with people. So I decided to go the other way. So I went through the alleyway and got through OK, and that's when the shooting began. So as I got around the other side, the shots started to go. And I listened to all the shooting. Now I did know that it was army fire. I didn't see the soldiers because of where I was lying, and I didn't see where the, who they were firing at, or where the bullets were actually going. But I lay there um, for a while, and I said to myself, "It's about time I got out of here." So I got up and I ran across Roswell Street, and as I did so, two bullets passed my head. You could hear a whoosh, whoosh, you know. So I eventually got across to the other side of the street, over to Liz Fannin Park, and the shooting started again. So I took cover in behind a building. And when I arrived there, my brother-in-law was there, one of my brother-in-laws. And we stood for a while to listen to the shooting. But as we stood there, we looked across the street, and we seen a group of people. And we wondered wh what they were doing. We had no idea. At that time, I had no idea anyone had been shot. No idea, because I didn't see anybody being shot. And we decided to cross over the street and go and have a look and see what they were doing. And as we stepped out from cover, two bullets bounced in front of us. And I looked around, and we couldn't see soldiers in front of us. We couldn't see them to the sides. There's only one place they could have came. They fired from the dirty walls into the bog side. And that's where the two bullets came from. 
So we dived into cover again, but then after a while, the shooting ended. So we decided to try and get across again. So we went across and we went and, uh, and gathered along with the people. Um, when we got there, we looked down and there was a body lying in the middle of the group. It was Jerry McKinney, who I didn't know at the time. And the people were actually trying to help him, give him some medical aid, resuscitate him and so on. But whilst I was standing there, I heard a shout from behind me. And it was another brother-in-law of mine's. And he seen me in the crowd. And when I looked around, he shouted to me, John, Michael's been shot. And that was the first time I knew he'd been shot. And they were carrying him from the house on a stretcher. So I joined them and helped to carry him. And we put him in the ambulance just outside the museum. And in the ambulance, we had also um, Jerry McKinney, who'd been shot, Michael, and also Joe Mahan. So those three people were in the ambulance. And we went to the hospital. On, but on, on, as we travelled to the hospital, as we travelled down Roswell Street, the parachute regiment were there, so we had to go through them you know, to get. And the ambulance was stopped by the parachute regiment. So I, I, I roared out the window, the F off. We're trying to get people to the hospital here. So they let us through. So we got to the hospital and we took Michael and the rest into the casualty area and the doctor, Dr. Jack, Jack Michael, and said, I'm sorry, he's dead. And I said to him, are you sure? And he checked him again and says, I'm sorry, he's dead. But eventually my father did arrive with my sister, one of my sisters, and we approached them as they walked down the corridor of the hospital and we, uh, uh, we told them Michael's dead. And I still see him sliding down the wall and starting to cry. Because they lived in hope that he wasn't dead. Apparently they've been told, my mother and father had been told that Michael had been shot in the ankle, but he was okay. So they believed he was still alive until they arrived at the hospital. So my father, I had to tell him. So eventually we had to go to the mortuary where all the bodies were taken. And it was a scene I'll never forget. A horrific scene. Something out of a horror movie. When we went into the mortuary, there was a bodies lying in trolleys, bodies lying on the floor, bodies in freezer units. And we had to go through the bodies <coughs> to eventually we found Michael. And my father formally identified him. That was the procedure. So as we left the mortuary, we were stopped by two policemen, two REC men. And they said to us, we want to ask you some questions. And to put it crudely, I told him to fuck off. I said, we have enough to deal with there. So we went on out. And then I remember then we were sitting in a car. Someone had arrived to take us home. And we were waiting for my father, who was in, still inside the hospital, and he must have been signing some forms or something. And as we sat there, I looked over to my left, and I seen this vehicle, army vehicle, drive up to the casualty. All of a sudden, the back doors were thrown open, and soldiers jumped, jumped out and started dragging bodies out. So they had three bodies in the back of the vehicle, and I remember them pulling them out with their ankles and, and carrying them by their arms showed them no respect whatsoever. And the three, the three bodies was John Young, Michael McDade, and Willie Nash. Those three were shot dead at the barricade. But what they did was they picked those three bodies up at 4.30. The time I seen them bringing those, vehicle, that, that, those bodies out of that vehicle was just after six o'clock. So they had those bodies for about an hour and a half. And the story is that one or two of them were still alive when they were in that vehicle when they were picked up at the barricade. But then we had to go home. And my mother was waiting in hope, living in hope that Michael was still alive. And we went into, when we arrived home, my mother and father's house, and we went into, through the front door and into the living room where my mother was sitting in the corner. 
waiting for us. And we had to tell her that Michael was dead. Never forget it. Bedlam, my mother went into hysterics. And the thing about her that she doesn't remember anything for approximately five years after it. She went into that state of mind, closure, closed down. And she was no good to herself. She couldn't look after herself. She couldn't look after her children. That's how badly it affected her. After Bloody Sunday, it became a war. And the time for peaceful protest was over. And you probably heard the story, a lot of young people joined the IRA. They reckoned Bloody Sunday was one of the best recruiting sergeants for any organization, especially the IRA. So a lot of young people were queuing up to join the IRA. So the civil rights movement was done, it was over. Things have changed dramatically. Things have changed, changed horrifically. That after that, it was about bombings, shootings, people dying on a daily basis. So it's cha things changed dramatically. And that one year of 1972, it had the most, uh, it was the worst year of death here. Nearly 500 people lost their lives in that year of 1972. And it was to do with the reaction of what happened here on that day. And I'm talking about young people who joined the IRA. I'm talking about soldiers. I'm talking about police. I'm talking about civilians. That's what happened here. It was massive. They reckon the, the first commemoration time it was commemorated was six months after Bloody Sunday. But then it became a yearly event, whereby it was commemorated every year through March. Uh, originally, it was, it was actually organized by the Northern End Civil Rights Association. But then it was actually take, took on, taken on board by Sinn Féin. So Sinn Féin organized the march for many, many years in the aftermath. So in other words, I have marched along with other families and many other family members for right up to the thir the year after we got Sabal, which was in 2010. So the actual last March I have been on was 2011. I haven't marched since. So thousands of people commemorated Bloody Sunday. Example, on the 25th anniversary, 40,000 people commemorated that day on one March. 40,000 people marched on the 25th anniversary. Um, the normal was between 10, 15, 20,000, depending on what year it was and so on. But prior to that there, the march was getting smaller and smaller. But the families came together on the 20th anniversary, along with other with friends and so on, and we organized uh, the Bloody Sunday Justice Campaign. And the families then became involved in the actual organization of the march. And we helped to uplift it. And we brought more people onto the streets and so on. So we, we helped to actually organize and run the march after 1992. Because the campaign had began. And then people were actually, more people were showing support for the campaign as the years went on. So that's the way it was. We had a cover up by the British in relation to the fact that our people were innocent. They, they condemned our, our people to be IRA gunmen and bombers. And that was totally untrue. But everyone knew the truth. Everyone knew that none of our, those who died and were injured that day were IRA. They, everyone knew that. But Woodry, he delivered a report that condemned our people. And the families weren't prepared to accept that. So that's why the campaign began. And we had three demands. One was a, rep uh, a full declaration of innocence for our people. The second one was a repudiation of Widgery, who was the first inquiry into Bloody Sunday. Repudiation, in other words, is to get rid of it, to repudiate, to get rid. And the third one was the prosecution of the soldiers and anyone who claimed or uh, planned Bloody Sunday. Now, that's, wh that's what our three demands were within the campaign. For many years we campaigned to get the case reopened, which we did achieve through a lot of hard work. 
and a new report, a new inquiry was set up. The new inquiry lasted for 12 and a half years, but the inquiry was to find out the truth about what happened. So for 12 and a half years, Lord Savile and his team investigated Bloody Sunday. And from that, we got a full declaration of innocence. Okay. If a person is innocent, the perpetrator who killed him, or her, or she, should be brought to justice. So we're in the final stages, I think, of the journey in relation to truth and justice. We had truth, not 100%, but now to complete, we have to see justice be done. So now what we have now is the police, the PSNI, who are now conducting a murder investigation into what happened. And our view on it is that these people should be brought, and brought into court and prosecuted for what they did here. My family and many other families want to see these guys go to jail because they're killers, they're murderers. They committed murder. They, tried to, they attempted murder as well. And there's only one answer to what they did here. And there's only one thing that we want is justice. And to us, that means these soldiers should go to jail. And we don't care what age they are. It's a material to us. Murder is murder is murder. That's what Maggie Thatcher said many years ago. And it shouldn't matter what age you are. You know, when quite recently there, we actually seen a, a 92 year old Nazi be brought in to be prosecuted for murder. Our, our situation is no different. There was a war crime committed here in this town, in Roswell Street. The war crime was committed against my brother and all those who died. And war criminals are brought to justice. So we see these guys as war criminals. End of story. And hopefully we will see that happen. Not all the families want that. So one or two of the families are happy with what they got out of Savile. They've seen their loved one being declared innocent. Other families want these guys prosecuted. The vast majority of them want these guys prosecuted. And I believe that is the only answer and the only way of closure for me and my family and all the others. I have met many leaders and who come into the museum all the time. They bring their, their, young, their young people with them. I have dealt with cross-community groups, Catholics, young Catholics, young Protestants. I have dealt with young, uh, Protestant students who come in from their schools. Um, and I talk to the, everyone exactly the same. You know, I tell them my story and I tell them what the museum is all about. And they're there to learn, the same as anyone else. I have, I have actually um, had the UVF in there, the also Volunteer Force. They're a paramilitary organization, Protestant Loyalist paramilitary organization. I have had the UDA, the also Defense Association, again a paramilitary loyalist organization. And I dealt with them exactly the way I've talked to you today. And they respect the story. They respect my role, they respect the fact that who I am, they respect the museum for what we're doing. Okay, you get the odd one, no, who would never accept what we say. But the vast majority of the people from the other side and all sides respect our story and respect us. And that's important. So we're about education. It's about teaching. And that's what our prime job is, to educate people when they come into the museum. And it doesn't matter if you're a young Protestant, a young Catholic, from Catalan, from Spain, from Bas the Basque Country, from anywhere in the world, Americans, French, Italians, doesn't matter. But it's important for the young people to learn what happened here because they can only learn from what we endured. And hopefully they would not be a part of a repeat, a repeat process of war. That is an important factor. What I'm doing now is not just for me, 
but it's for my children and my grandchildren. It's, they, are, they are the future. And hopefully they will learn from what we went through that hopefully they would never have to endure like us. We are in a peace process at the moment. If you look out there, the young guys and girls are getting on like any normal teenager anywhere else in the world. They are doing their thing. They are enjoying themselves. We hadn't got that. You know, as we were coming up, we were in the middle of a war. We had bombs going off, people dying on a daily basis. Not sure whether to go onto the street. Not sure whether I should go to my work. Not sure if my, my son should go to school. That is all gone. Now the young people have a better place than we had. That they have a normal life. Things can only get better. And hopefully that will be the case for the future. Things will get better. But it's up to the politicians and it's up to us to ensure that happens. And I think through pure education, the horrors of war, the p things would return to that. Common sense. People understand each other. And that's what it's all about. Well, we elect politicians. And we elect them to do a job. We expect them to do that job. But the difficulty in this part of the world is the old regime the one of people trying to stay in the status quo. In other words, remain, keep it as their ancestors had. We're in a different era here now. The old uh, politics have now disappeared. Now it's shared politics. We have nationalists, Republicans sitting along with unionist loyalists. 15 years ago, no one thought that would ever happen. And it's so down to the politicians who will determine which direction this country will go. Ireland got a lot out of the European community, you know, through funding and so on, you know. Uh, we got a lot out of it. We have had European funding as well and so on. And, and it's great, you know, that when you look around, around all the different countries who are trying to join, even trying to still join the European community, it can only be better for everyone. And, and, and plus the fact too, there's less chance of war here among us, you know. And the old days, you know, you had all the separation, all the different countries, and you have many, many wars, and, and you still have that. But there's no wars going on within the European community at the moment, is there? I don't think there is, is there? And it's down to the people. And it can only be for the betterment of the people. The Euro, I think, created a bit of a problem because, and I know you're British, the British, they want to hang on to their pound, their pound sterling. I am a European citizen, but mostly Irish. I'm an Irish man. I have, a Euro, I have an Irish, Irish passport. I haven't got a European passport. I don't know if you can get one of those or not. I don't know. But um, I'm for, first and foremost Irish. But I, I am part of the European community. Yeah. I was in Brussels there last year in relation to the Jared Donaghy case, when Jared Donaghy was shot dead on Bloody Sunday. Martina Anderson, who is a MEP, and she took us across to Brussels to put forward a case in support of Jared Donaghy's situation, you know. And, you know, when you, when you walk in there and you look at all the different nationalities, you hear all the different tongues, all the different languages being spoken and so on, you say to yourself, you know, this isn't bad. This isn't bad, you know. That's good. I think it's good.